Hello class. Today I wanted to go over one of the more tricky concepts in this mechanics and materials course, which is going to be the force method. Um, this is the first time that we're going to start looking at the stiffness method. Uh, these are the sorts of methods that our computer systems do in order for us to uh, calculate forces on a complex structure, like an entire building, things like that. So these sorts of calculations are what's happening behind the scenes. Um, the first thing we're going to look at is this kind of simple model where we've got a structure with three uh, deformable copy, copper alloy rods and, uh, sorry, uh, three, three deformable rods, one, two that are uh, this copper alloy and one that is a stainless steel alloy. Uh, and then we also have this, it's stuck between these two fixed walls. Uh, at A and C on the left and F on the right. So in order to solve this, because if we looked at this with just statics, we, this would be statically indeterminate because we only have one direction of force. We can't use our moment equations because we don't have enough information. We, the only way for us to solve this is to use the method of force. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to kick out that extra support. This is analysis land, right? I want you to channel your inner Leonidas and we're gonna analyze the entire structure without the support. So that's case one. So we need to do this analysis here and find out what is that deformation? How much does this left, this right point move when we apply this force of 40 kilonewtons? Um, I've already kind of simplified this. I know what's gonna happen in terms of if this is the only part that's supported, 40 kilonewtons will go here, 40 kilonewtons will go here, um, which means not that this will be 20, but this will be 40 altogether. So let me fix that here. Just goes to show you this is the reason why you want to go over your work and double check all of your work. Make sure that you don't make any mistakes as you go. All right, so that's 40 kilonewtons. So that's that's what we're going to expect to see there. Now, we know that we removed that case, so let's go back and put that phantom support back in. In order for this thing to be in equilibrium, we are going to need to put that force back in. You'll notice that none of the applied forces show up in case two, just that force Fx and any reaction forces that it's going to cause. So if Fx pulls this way, I would actually expect these arrows to go the opposite way. So let me make a little edit here. Let's just make that quick edit. We'll go switch to the purple here. Now, if I put these two things together, I'm gonna to get back to this original case here. So this is kind of my, my method. This is superposition says this case, no support, and this case with just the support and any reactions that it causes gets us there. And that kind of makes sense, right? If this was, if, if F wasn't there, we'd only have 40 kilonewtons, but because Fx is there, there is some force at Fx pulling this thing back to the right. Uh, the 40 kilonewtons plus half of that Fx is going to get us to the actual reaction at Ax. Uh, same thing here, 40 kilonewtons plus this Fx gets us to the actual reaction at C. All right, now in order to solve this, we're gonna need our compatibility equation. Our compatibility equation has to do with um, this is also called the kinematic equation it relates our deformations. So we're saying from case one, when we push on this thing, these two will deform, this and this, uh, A, B, and C, D, these are gonna deform as this thing gets pushed on. There's actually no force through here for this case. So the only thing that's deforming is this one. So any deformation here uh, is going to also move the EF to the left, and that we'll call that deformation D1. And in this case, when we deform it, we're gonna be moving this thing to the right as we pull Fx this way. And we know that because it's between two fixed points, these two walls are fixed, that the deformation from this case, which will be negative, and the deformation from this case, which will be positive, will add to zero. All right, so let's calculate those deformations. Now we know the deformation Axial deformation for any object is going to be in the normal force inside of the object is times L divided by our area divided by our 
Young's modulus. Now let's take a look at our Young's modulus. For this case, these two rods on the left are brass. So let's figure out what that is. So let's look up E for brass. E for brass, we can go over to the table on the back of our book. So for the brass alloy that it calls for, which is the 8384 or 83C, 83400. I'll fix this in place. The 83400 is going to have a Young's modulus of 101 gigapascals. So I'm going to write that down here 101 gigapascals. All right, and then we're also going to need the uh, value for our stainless 304. That's a lot stiffer at 193 gigapascals. So we're going to put that over here. E for the stainless steel is going to be uh, 193 gigapascals. All right, so we have those values that we pulled from our chart. Let's do those calculations. So let's figure out what D1 is first. So D1 is just going to be the deformation of one of these brass bars. Um, D1 is going to be negative because our normal force and that in one of these is going to be negative 40 kilonewtons. And you might be asking me, Albert, why aren't you doubling this? Well, the reality is, is we know that the force in both of these are the same. We have a rigid bot cap here, right? Remember this black part is rigid. It tells us in the problem statement that it's going to be rigid, rigid cap G. That rigid cap tells us that the deformations in these two things have to be the same in order for this thing to be in equilibrium, which makes sense of the same area too. So we're going to use that. Where for our length, we're going to make sure that we've got the correct length here for just the, for just the bars. So this will be 30, uh, 300 millimeters. So I'm going to convert that to our 0.3 meters. And then we have area and E. And for this E, we're going to be using 101 gigapascals. And for this area, we're going to be using our diameter. We know that these are uh, have a diameter of 30 millimeters. So uh, diameter of 30 millimeters. So if we do this calculation, this will be 0 0.03 meters squared times pi over 4. Now, this is a bit of a mess here if we do it this way. We have to really be careful about tracking our units. So if we think about this, we in the top, we have kilonewton meters. In the bottom, we're going to have meters squared times gigapascals. Now, gigapascals are 10 to the ninth newton meters. And a kilonewton is uh, 10 to the third newton meters, or sorry, kil uh, 10 to the third newtons. So in the top here, you basically have newton meters divided by newton meters. Let's double check our units. So this is be uh, newtons per meter squared, excuse me, newtons per meter squared. So on the bottom we have newtons, because the meter squared and the meter squared cancel out, and we get something like this. So what we're going to get is something something on the order of 10 to the what power? Let's take a look at this. If this is 10 to the third up here, and this is 10 to the ninth, we're going to have 10 to the negative 6 meters. So when we do this calculation, we're going to get a very, very small number here um, as we do this. Now, one thing that can be helpful if you want to look at it like this, if you want to calculate your area in terms of millimeter squared, or that a millimeter squared, one meter squared, or sorry, a millimeter is 10 to the negative third meters times 10 to the negative third meters. So it's kind of helpful to think about this as a negative 10 to the negative six meters squared. So that's kind of a useful way to do this. Sometimes I prefer to work my units like that. If I wrote this, uh, so another option to write this equation with, this, with the same, well, with the same order for our units is to write this as, this is pi of four times 30 
squared meter squared times 10 to the negative, sorry, 10 to the negative six meters. Ten to the negative six meters times ten to the negative ninth, or ten to the ninth meters. Why do I do this? Well, the nice thing about this is it makes all my units cancel out in a nice, really compact way. Ten to the sixth pascals. Uh, sorry, ten to the ninth pascals because it's giga. Um, so in this case. Uh, a lot of my units cancel out. If in the bottom I had 10 to the third, because it's 10 to the negative six times 10 to the ninth. And in the top, I have kilonewtons, which is 10 to the third. So the nice thing about this is these cancel out quite nicely. Um, I will get the same answer numerically if I solve it either way. All right, I had a trek on my calculator, but uh, with a little work, you can see that uh, plugging this in your calculator, you get negative 106 times 10 to the negative six meters. Or if I use this method here where I convert that millimeter or I leave that millimeters in there and I just calculate it as uh, 10 to the negative six meters squared. Um, it's really convenient because it gets me to the same, oops, gives me to the same numerical answer right there. Um, so it's kind of up to you which method you prefer, uh, but I pre kind of prefer doing this. Um, do remember, be careful here that this is negative because I put a negative value on there. All right, let's talk about the compatibility equation now. On the other side, let's look at case two. I'm going to switch colors. So that's case one. Case two is coming just from that fx, right? This is the fx case. And I should call it the fx only case. All right, so let's get that deformation. So we start looking at this. There's two parts of this deformation. Uh, we're going to have the deformation in the brass on this left side, and we have the deformation in the stainless steel on the right side. Both of these are going to be in tension, but these values are going to be a little bit different. So we could write this like so. We could say it looks like normal force times the length times area times E of brass plus the normal force times the length times area divided by or of the stainless steel. In both of these cases, these are positive values, um, but I could factor out the f of x. What else is similar between these two? You'll notice that the length of these, is two, of these two is different. A lot of this stuff is different here, um, but I'm going to factor out a little bit here because I know that that'll make my life a little bit easier. If I know that this is going to be f of x divided by 2, right, in my brass, each of those is taking half of that load. So I could factor out f of x. The first one would be uh, in the brass. I would need to divide by 2. In the stainless steel, I would not divide by 2. That would just be the length. I'll leave that length in terms of uh, 0.450 meters. My area will be pi over 4. Now that pi over 4 is going to be both of those. So let's factor out that pi over 4 as well. Let's factor out that pi over 4. We still need diameter squared, so I'll put that in there. My diameter squared uh, for this one on this side is going to be 40. So I'm going to do that same trick that I did in the last part. I'm going to do 40 40 squared, remembering that is uh, 10 to the negative 6 meters squared times my value of, uh, in this case for the stainless steel, that's that 193 times 10 to the ninth. Make sure that you put pascals there. I'm going to zoom in a little bit to make this writing easier on myself uh, for my normal force. For this one, it's going to be 0 0.03 meters on the top. And the bottom, I have 10 to the negative 6. And then remember, this is 30. 30 squared plus uh, times 10 to the negative 6. 
meters squared and the same value of 101 times 10 to the ninth Pascals. That's in the bottom here. Um, and let's try to get this uh, solved in terms of f of x. So I can simplify this a little bit here. Uh, I'll pause while I use my calculator, since that's not super exciting. All right, so plugging that into my calculator, uh, I've simplified this a little bit. What's inside of my parentheses up here, or my bracket up here, it's going to be that 0. 0.000003. Uh, if I multiply that by 4 and divide by pi, which is the same as divide by pi over 4, I'll get this value here. Now, that is my deformation too. So that's what's going to happen after this thing is stretched. All right. So our next step, very last step, is to set these two equal using that compatibility equation. Because I know these things are equal and opposite, I could say d1 is equal to d2 is equal to negative d2. Or sorry, let's do it this way. Um, because I know those things are equal, we'll do uh, d2 is equal to negative d1 moving that D1 over to the other side, that's going to look something like, well, D2 is going to be that 0.00004 times Fx, coming from over here. And that's going to be equal to our negative of our negative 0 0.000168. So, uh, dividing those two things, and I'm going to do this in my calculator, so I'm not rounding here. This is really important because this value is uh, very, very small. So it's uh, if I simplify, if I use this exact value instead of using the more accurate answer in my calculator, I'll get some weirdness. So I want to make sure I'm using the most accurate values here uh, from my calculator. And I'm going to get 42.5. At this point, you might be asking, what are the units? Let's go back and take a look. Whenever I define a variable, if I'm going to do math with it, it's a good idea for me to define those units. So I did not do that, but I want to highlight how to do that. All I could do here is just go ahead and name this as kilonewtons. Now, this is nice because it is. Uh, consistent with what we did over here where we plugged in kilonewtons. So I know if I'm plugging in kilonewtons here and I'm following that same method, if I follow that method here, if fx is in kilonewtons, that tells me what this value is going to be. So now I know what my reaction at f is going to be. Now it does tell me to figure out what the normal stress is based on that. So remember the normal stress is going to be the combination of these two things. Um, so to find the internal forces, the cool thing about that is I can take what I know about these two things. So in this case, my internal force and in this member is uh, Fx. If I make a cut here, my internal force is zero. Remember that uh, all of that force is going out to the left um, in this case where we remove the reaction. So the cool thing about that is I can just combine those two. So I know that my normal force in my member on the right, which I'll make sure I get it right, is EF. I now know my normal force EF is just going to be the combination of 0 plus 42.5 or 42.5 kilonewtons. For each of my little members on the left for A, B, and C, D, These are going to be equal. And I can just add these two cases. So in this case, if I take this cut, my normal force is 40 kilonewtons. And if I take this cut, it's fx over 2. It's fx over 2, right? If I take this cut, if I looked at the left side, it's very clearly fx over 2. Now this one, in this case, would be in compression, right? I'm pushing on this member. It's going to be in compression, so that's negative. And then in this case, I'm pulling on it, right? So it's going to be positive. So if I combine these two things of negative 40, oops, let me not move that. If I do that and I do negative 40, I do negative 40 kilonewtons plus fx over 2, 
which I know is going to be negative 40 plus 21.25. That's this value divided by 2. If I add those two together, I now get the internal force of 0.75. Uh, that's going to be 18.75 kilonewtons. And in this case, it's going to be negative because it's in compression. And we'll go ahead and round it to three significant dig digits, as is our practice. Now, in this case, I'm not fully completed. I still need to find what those internal forces are, or internal stress, or what the stresses are. But now I know the internal forces, so that's a very quick step from there. So I'm going to stop my work, I'll let you find out the stresses on your own. But that's the basic process. So what do we do? First, we drew the two cases, one without the support, one with the support only, and any reactions that it causes. You notice I didn't create, didn't add any of those additional forces there. Uh, then I use the compatibility equation, knowing that these two things are going to be equal to zero, knowing that A and B, uh, A and B are a and F are fixed. And then uh, D1 and D2, uh, I calculated those deformations D1 and D2. And then putting that all together, I've used those two deformations, setting those two equal and opposite. I figured out what that reaction at Fx is going to be. Once I have that reaction at Fx, it's all downhill from there. I could go, go ahead and use my statics equations, or I could use superposition like I did here to figure out what's going on in the rest of the structure. It's up to you. You don't have to use superposition at the end, but that's kind of what I'm doing here. Remember that this is case one, case two, uh, and I did the same thing here. This is case one, and this is case two.